Uh, how do you see Andrea streaming money for entrepreneurs selling goods, not services, because that's I can figure out you can stream, but goods regarding streaming money of the salary and suppose a network of companies they have like a holding structure and you know well you're gonna have to manage cash flow i mean you have to manage cash flow right now in terms of they don't know balancing that. incoming inventory outgoing sales and salaries that happen on three different time scales we're simply talking about changing some of those time scales and it's going to require new processes it's going to require new software it's going to require new accounting and it's going to open up new opportunities. It's not as useful if you're a company that is receiving cash flow streams that come in on a per product basis and inventory that's coming in on a per monthly basis to try to pay your employees on a per minute basis. That's going to cause you some cash flow nightmares. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. But um, you know, companies manage cash flow today and sometimes the product sales are delayed and sometimes the uh, inventory doesn't arrive, and they use investment money and operational capital to bridge the gap between the two. So you just do that, but on a different time scale. Okay. I'm going to think about it. Yes, think about it. We're all going to be thinking about it for the next two decades. Just-in-time delivery will be transformed by this. Yeah, just-in-time delivery and a lot of time-based services. Um, lending. lending as well. Borrow more when you need it. Rotating credit accounts. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the ideas that can come out of this are pretty much endless. Not all of them will be practical, but we'll see. Yeah, uh, speaking of ideas related to this, have you uh, heard of anything where someone's like uh, integrating the payment right into the media that's being streamed? It seems like it's almost like another approach to DRM. Uh, yes, we have seen that. Um, we see it. Uh, one of the first demonstration applications for a payment channel was uh, called Streamium.io, which is a video streaming service that allows you to pay for as much video as you watch on a per minute basis of billing. So you put a deposit for what you think you're going to watch, let's say 30 minutes, and then every minute of video that you receive, you, you're your browser application signs a new transaction that pays for that minute and then at the end of the stream when you disconnect or when they disconnect um, the last transaction represents your balance so in the actual stream yes so streaming video streaming uh, uh, courses for education um, all kinds of applications like that could be transformed anything that's time-based uh, service uh, could be transformed in, in many ways using this technology. If you try to tie it to DRM, um, digital rights management, you're going to find out the uh, basic rule of DRM, which is DRM doesn't work. Um, because I can stream that video while holding a camera in front of my screen and then redistribute it for free. It's not going to change the fundamental thing that if my eyes can see it, so can a camera. If my ears can hear it, so can a microphone. And copying information is uh, cheap and easy. It doesn't change the basic um, piracy DRM uh, competition. What it does is it allows artists and content creators to be able to connect directly with their audience without using a platform. Uh, because one of the main reasons these platforms exist is because they have to aggregate payments to a level of two or three or five or six dollars, which is the minimum you can charge on a credit card. So the credit cards cause centralization of these platforms. Hi, Andreas. Um, thank Hello. you so much. I have to say uh, your analogies are fantastic, especially thank for someone you. who's pretty new to blockchain. Um, my question is around how you think blockchain might apply to developing economies and particularly bottom of the pyramid business models, coupled with things like microfinance products. I was just wondering how you see that um, potentially changing the world with some of the poorest economies. Um, I think it's going to have that impact, but it's going to take a while. And part of the reason it's going to take a while is because 
the places where this technology will be most applicable are places where you have this particular combination of extreme need, technological infrastructure, literacy among the population, numeracy among the population, and access, opportunity to use this technology. Now, most of you here look younger than I am. I remember my first cell phone. I got it in London. It was 1991. I was really excited, because it was the first generation of cell phones that didn't come with a suitcase attached. <laughs> I'm not joking. Cell phones before then were a handset connected to a suitcase. My cell phone was about this big, before you extracted the antenna. It worked in a half-mile radius around central London. It had an awesome talk time of 20 minutes, and a standby time of an hour and 30. Which means it could only be plugged in, which means it wasn't a mobile phone. <laughs> How long before every Kenyan farmer, every Polynesian tribesperson, every um, sub-Saharan Africa, a hunter, every Inuit on a snowmobile, had a globally connected cell phone with at least the basics of a data plan or an SMS plan. It took about 15 to 20 years. And if you looked at the technology right then, you'd say, it's too expensive, it's too bulky, it doesn't have enough range, only rich people are using that. Guess what the ultimate status symbol of a mobile phone is today? Someone else carrying it. <laughs> if I'm walking along and I haven't touched the cell phone in a week, and my assistant carries the cell phone, I have arrived. <laughs> That's what it means to be rich. It means you never touch a cell phone. <laughs> and if you wear a Bluetooth headset, you're a blue-collar tradesperson. Right? Remember when those were status symbols? Not anymore. That transition took a long time. And if you didn't see it at the beginning through lack of vision, you looked at the flaws of the technology, the scale of the technology. But cell phones, like many technologies, were on an exponential curve. Every two years, half the price. Every two years, twice the range. Every two years, twice the battery life, twice the bandwidth. And if you do that for 20 years, you get a thousand X improvement. A 2,000x improvement. We're going to see that happen with Bitcoin. People are upset today, and they say like fees are high. Yes, fees are high. This Bitcoin won't work for micropayments. They're not going to stay that way. We're going to reach the next level of scale, and at some point, fees are going to be much, much lower again, and then they're going to be much too high again, and it's going to oscillate back and forth. But this technology is moving on an exponential curve. We will do microfinance. We will reach every corner of the planet. And the best reason for that is because every one of those cell phones that's out there is now a bank. One day, it will be used as such. And that's going to change the world.